Hello, and welcome to another conversation with the Middle East Monitor. Uh, my name is Nassim Ahmed. I will be your host for today's conversation, which will be on the latest edition of the European Islamophobia Report covering the year 2020. I am joined by the report's editor, uh, Farid Hafiz. Farid is a visiting professor of international studies at Williams College and a non-resident senior researcher at Georgetown University's The Bridge Initiative at the School of Foreign Service. Since 2010, he has been the editor of Islamophobia Studies Yearbook. And over the past six years, he has been the co-editor of the European Islamophobia Report. Thank you for joining us, Farid. It's a real pleasure to have you on the show. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, first of all, you know, congratulations on um, the successful publication of this uh, year's report. It's, uh, it's an enormous piece of work, I should say. It's around um, some 900 pages long. Um, so I'm going to give you the very tough task of just broadly giving us the brief genesis of this year's annual report and also um, tell our readers what they can expect to find in it. All right. Well, first of all, I mean, I always have to thank uh, uh, all the others who have been participating in that project, because uh, at the end of the day, this is a collective work of more than 30 scholars and activists, NGO activists who are involved in writing uh, the respective country reports. We cover more than 30 countries, and this is what we've been doing for uh, the last six years now. So I'm always very grateful that there is such an amount of uh, critical people who are willing also to do this kind of work, uh, who are concerned uh, regarding the development uh, and the expansion of Islamophobia in their respective countries, but uh, more generally throughout Europe. So what can you expect if you uh, want to read this report? I mean, what we do is basically um, we try to give an idea of what happened. And it's really very much like kind of a collection of everything that happened between January 1st and December 31st in, a, in each year. Um, maybe, the, maybe to say something about uh, the reason why we even have established this kind of report. I, I remember back then in 2014 when we started this, um, you know, there was a lot of talk on, on, on the side of, uh, anti-racist organizations, but also Muslim uh, NGOs, that um, Islamophobia is a problem. But, you know, whenever people went to the state authorities or even to other people as uh, potential allies in civil society, there was always this feeling like, okay, where are the facts? So this is what we wanted to provide. And this is really what the European Islamophobia Report is all about. It's about providing the facts that you cannot anymore deny the existence. You know, obviously, when you speak to Muslim folks out there, everybody can tell you hundreds of stories of things that they have lived through, right? But as long as this is not written, it's like it doesn't exist. So this was basically the main idea why we even came up with that. And I think we did a good job. I think uh, all, all of the people who have been participating, more than 100 authors, meanwhile, have done a great job in providing this and making it clear and not deniable anymore. Islamophobia is here. Islamophobia is a problem. So what we want then, and this is kind of also how every single report ends, is a list of recomm recommendations for civil society and policymakers that people think about how to overcome, think about how to move against uh, these uh, 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 forms of exclusion. You mentioned, you spoke about uh, um, resistance to um, Islamophobia from certain sections of society. Um, how strong is that resistance at the moment? I mean, for you and I, we know Islamophobia exists. There's people out there who are in complete denial. Uh, growing up in the West uh, myself, I, I can clearly distinguish between, say, for example, racism I suffered when I was young to the Islamophobia you suffer now. There's a clear distinction. A lot of the distractors will say, no, there's no such thing as Islamophobia. It's racism against Muslims, racism against um, Black people, Asian people, yes. But you, people like me, I, I can clearly see the difference when I'm being called something when I was in my te teens to when I'm where when people are experiencing real life Islamophobia. Um, yeah. You know, why have they 
been unwilling and refusing to accept that there has been a shift in the way Muslims experience racism in the West right now. There's been such a resistance to that. Yeah, I mean, maybe to distangle this, um, I mean, maybe to speak about two different things here. On one hand, um, there is this denial, and I think there will always be this denial because uh, merely the, uh, accepting uh, the existence um, is a problem because it needs then a solution. It needs people to act upon it. So obviously, those who are deeply Islamophobic, <laughs> mm. they, they, they are not interested in any form of overcoming that, okay? So that's for sure. But also, we should not forget that there are those who may want to help, but they have to argue for that. So providing them with information, with a report like that is of help, right? Because it allows them to make a case. There is a problem. We have to do something about it. Uh, then obviously, um, I mean, in, in terms of racism and Islamophobia, may, maybe also to make that, this clear here, the, the, we have a working definition that we um, propose, which is a very much related actually and using Islamophobia syn synonymously with anti-Muslim racism. What we are concerned about, and, and the way also maybe just to, to, to give you a brief idea, our idea of what um, Islamophobia is, is that we say Islamophobia is about a dominant group of people aiming at seizing, stabilizing, and widening their power by means of defining a scapegoat. In this case, the, the Muslim. In order to exclude these Muslim people, who are an imagined community from the resources, from the rights, and from the definition of who we are as a society within a nation state. So this is, this is our understanding of Islamophobia. So it's very much related to the dimension of power um, and very much related to also understanding Islamophobia, not only um, as anti-Muslim hate crime, like the discrimination that is happening on a daily basis on the streets, but rather also as a structural problem that is very much tied to power structures. Um, therefore, if you look into our report, we give an idea of what happened in the, in, in the labor market, what happened in the justice system, what happened in politics, what happened in media, what happened in the internet, and so on and so forth. So it's trying to give a, a very a comprehensive idea of what, what how Islamophobia materializes. So um, coming back to this question, um, under, if, if we understand Islamophobia as anti-Muslim racism, then uh, obviously the problem is not so much with the Muslims. The problem is very much with the power circles, right? And this is what, what we're tackling. Like, and obviously that's going to be a tough thing, right? Because yeah. who, wanna, who wants to listen? Who wants to give a piece of his power and share it with somebody else. But I think that's the ultimate question at the end of the day. Why? Because in a longer perspective, and this is especially true, I think, for the Western European, Western part of, uh, of Europe, um, on a longer perspective, Muslims are a large portion of the society. And the question is ultimately, which place do they have, right? Yeah, I mean, you touched on a lot of issues there. And, uh... And your report, of course, goes into um, great length in exploring not just the definition, but the real life um, experience of Muslims and the impact it's having on uh, Europe's uh, Muslim citizens. I wonder if I can begin uh, really with your own personal experience. Uh, some would say your own experience is um, um, is uh, typical of why you know a report like this is so important. Uh, the raid on your home, of course, you know, um, did not come out of the blue. Uh, but before we get to that, but can you give us a, a background to uh, the November 2020 incident when the Austrian police raided your house as part of a wider crackdown on Muslim activists? It's for our listeners just to get a sense of how it's having a real life impact on academic, a scholar like yourself, you know, who is an upstanding citizen, but gets caught up in this dragnet of state uh, suppression. Um, how did that happen? Well, I mean, you know, there is a lot to say about that. <laughs> and it's not uh, something that I could be, I would be able to do within five minutes, but to 
in, I mean, for connecting it, you know, this whole story with my work on Islamophobia, just to give you an, a glimpse of an idea of, of why that is happening. Um, obviously, I mean, the raid, you know, on, on November 2nd, there was a militant attack in downtown Vienna, which was perpetrated by a former um, sympath sympathist of ISIS. Um, the perpetrator was killed on November 2nd, so we don't really have much more details other than what he used to be aligned with, at least ideologically speaking. One week later, a raid happened that um, had about 70 victims, individuals as, as well as institutions, all Muslim, but which was unrelated to this attack, legally speaking. And also the politicians said, well, there is no relationship, but nevertheless, the, the whole atmosphere was like, you know, what, what is the government now gonna do after the first time in Austrian history uh, in the last 20 years, uh, such an attack happened by an alleged Islamist. So the idea was then, okay, you know, the government wanted to show, we, we toughen them. So that's, I think this is kind of the context in which we have to understand also when that happened and how it was politicized in a way. Um, let me just get the, <clears throat> get back the light. Um, yeah. So obviously one of the things uh, at stake here, I think in, in terms of my person was, my work on Islamophobia. And, and I'll just give you one example of what you can find in the files in the investigation uh, against my, my, my person. So one of the things that they uh, would say was, and that's a literal quote um, of the investigation by the Austrian Secret Service, how they framed any kind of I would say opposition to the government. So they said, they allegedly uh, argued that they had found a strategy paper for the establishment of what they call a parallel society, which is kind of what the Muslim ghetto is in Anglo, uh, in the Anglo-Saxon world. And they said in the strategy papers for the establishment of a parallel state or caliphate, it is defined that a public discourse must take place by means of the term Islamophobia. So in other words, uh, this is quote unquote, in other words, what they're saying is whoever speaks about Islamophobia wants to create a caliphate. Okay, so then they came, raided the houses of so many people, including myself, because they were arguing, uh, like legally speaking, it's uh, because of terrorism. So you accused, you, a suspect of a terrorist organization, right? And they, you know, with all the implications it had, five o'clock in the morning, raiding the house, waking up the kids with heavy, heavy weapons, a bank account and, and assets frozen. Um, you know, then when the media starts speaking about this, it's like your reputation is completely destroyed and so on and so forth. So obviously um, this, I think even more important, the signal that had on the wider Muslim community and also on the wider Austrian society was very much a wave of intimidation that the people felt, especially because um, we were denied access to the files. That's why we did not even know what the heck is going on here. Mm. So it was like, um, maybe there is something you know, they want to create a connection between you and the guy who did that. You know, nobody knew at that moment. And for the first three, four months when we had no access to the files. So that was a tough time. And it shows you like how difficult it might be doing the work that I'm doing. And I feel also not only myself, but also if I look to other authors in other European countries who did the European Islamophobia report on their country, you know, people were criticized by the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Minister of Interior. It's not, it's not a small thing, right? If you get 
uh, become uh, a public the whole public attention is drawn on you because you, you you criticize your government for doing some Islamophobic stuff and then you become a public enemy. Um, and I feel and I see that more and more authors that we have might be natives of their countries they do reports on, but they are act actually living outside of the country because this is making it easier for them. And, you know, coming to such a point where is that the case with you? Is that why you're in the U.S. still? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, I consider myself in a way living in a form of exile. So there, there is no much environment for me really to do that kind of work. And, you know, having, not having to fear that the police storms your house at five o'clock in the morning, destroys your door and intimidates your children, your small children, and so on and so forth. I mean, this is not um a way you want to live your life right mm -hmm. um so yes uh i think that also shows us how difficult it has become in certain countries i'm by no means i'm saying that this is all the case in all over europe but there are certain countries like austria like france like denmark which are very very hawkish in uh in their not only in their islam policies but also in the way how they treat uh, critical scholarship and people who speak out against uh, these injustices that they are witnessing. For, for, for those who don't aren't following the rise of Islamophobia in Europe, I think what you're saying, just that segment, would be quite chilling that this so-called liberal democratic country is so quickly turned as authoritarian as it did, you know, cracking down on your home without really any evidence. Um, I was wondering whether you can see, um, of course, it didn't come out of the blue, you know, there's certain uh, context, political, social um, context, which has given rise to this level of uh, crackdown authoritarianism in many of these countries, Austria and France in particular. Um, what do you see is the common thread connecting, you know, Islamophobia, the raid in your house, what's happening in France, uh, you mentioned Denmark and elsewhere in Europe. What are the key threads that unite Islamophobia in the 32 countries um, that your report covers? Well, I, I would not say that there are like some key features that you can see all over the places. I think uh, there are, the contexts are just too too different. Um, I mean, even when I speak about you know this my own case uh, which I have gone through and the Austrian situation, Austria is very different, alongside maybe France and Denmark, who are kind of having this kind of alliance also in trying to criminalize uh, Muslim civil society as well as, as a critical scholarship um, uh, on these issues uh, compared, let's say, maybe to other countries like Spain and Portugal or uh, other countries in, in, the, in the east of the, uh, uh, of the European Union. Um, so the experiences are different. I think also in terms of like even if you look into those countries, you know, like Austria, you don't find a lot of solidarity that that uh, if, if you become a victim of such a crackdown. Mm -hmm. um, but um, in other countries, there are much strong anti-racist organizations. In, in some countries, you have a, Muslims um, are part of the political uh, system, right? They are in different political parties. They have some, something to say they represent. Rather, in, in other countries where still the majority of politicians is like very white and um, and those Muslims who are allowed an entrance into the sphere of life are like only this super assimilated, you know, it's like there is very little uh, space also to contest uh, these policies. So I would not speak of general trends throughout the throughout Europe, but mm. this is what we're doing like every year we're trying to find to uh, to um, in, in a way make aware of certain developments that are very very troubling, and that is for for that year was what happened in France for 2020, and in other years it was like more putting an emphasis on what happened in terms of militant uh, uh, underground far right parties. Uh, and, and, and movements who are very much drawing on Islamophobia and and committing committing uh, violence against uh, people, killing people. And where are we seeing the biggest rise in that? Because it's one of the things I was going to ask you about the yeah. rise of militant Islamophobia. Where are we seeing which European states are we seeing this rising the most? 
I mean, one of the interesting things is obviously that, um, you know, not every nation state and not, a, not every uh, media within the nation state really talks about uh, that, uh, these issues very extensively. And a lot of our authors are also rely on media reports to some extent, but um, there have been cases in France, there have been cases in Germany, there have been cases in uh, Sweden, there have been cases in Austria. Uh, where you find uh, far-right movements in the underground that prepare for what they call the day X. Day X stands for the time when they're going to have a push, when they're going to uh, push the political system and try to create an authoritarian state that is governed by themselves. And uh, what we can see is that, um, and I think, you know, certain countries realize that this is really a threat even to their power, much more than uh, their, the imagined threat of Muslims is, right? So when their politicians, for instance, get killed, like it happened uh, with Walter Lübcke, a, a famous German uh, a grand politician of the Christian Democratic Union, he was killed in his private home from by a sniper, right? Why? Because he was a very pro-immigrant, had a very pro-immigrant stances when it came to the influx of refugees from uh, Syria and Iraq back in 2015. So the moment, you know, somebody who is part of your political system is threatened to such an extent, he loses his life, he is killed in his own balcony. That shows you, I mean, that, that is the moment when people understand, you know, Islamophobia is not only a threat to the Muslim community, it's a threat to us. And I think that's the moment, you know, when they realize we have to do something about it. And that is, I think, also one of the reasons why we see, for instance, in countries like Germany, a lot of attempts also to go against this. I mean, Germany, uh, at the end of the day, they established um, an expert round by the Ministry of Interior to fight what they call anti-Muslimness, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so th that, that is something. I mean... Uh, you know, still you have the other side and uh, other state authorities doing quite the opposite. But, you know, it is this kind of tension that, it, that, that is uh, created by these uh, incidents. Yeah, I mean, I mean, talking about threats, I think the, the turn France has taken in Austria is probably a threat to what we would say is healthy, healthy liberal democracies. They, they are authoritarian liberals in, in some sense, which is how many people choose to describe them. Um, on the issue of um, uh, uh, far-right violent um, extremism and their rise, um, I mean, instead of that, you chose to put Macron on the front cover of your report uh, uh, this year, um, yeah. uh, rather than, say, for example, a far-right extremist who wants to you know, throw Muslims out violently from Europe. Um, what does that say about the shape of Islamophobia in Europe now. Um, Macron is a centrist, you know, some would say progressive, liberal. What does that say about where Islamophobia is heading in this, in this current year at least? Well, first of all, um, definitely an important aspect. And I mean, we wanted to make aware of, uh, of this problem of institutionalized Islamophobia by the governments, not by the far right. I mean, we always have to keep in mind no matter how bad the far right is, at the end of the day, you know, in most countries, it is at the margin of the political system. They are mostly in opposition. They are, and if they come to power, they only stay for two years because they just don't have the human resources to really run a country. I mean, that has always been the experience in most Western European countries where the far right has been part of a coalition government. Um, so the problems that we're seeing that Muslims are facing are not so much only from these far-right groups. I mean, the problem that the far-right groups are creating is obviously that they are shaping the public discourse. So they are putting in, in a way a discursive pressure on the rest of the political parties. So they either have to stand on the side of the Muslims and defend them and stand against Islamophobia, or they starting to co-opt these claims. And this is what we're witnessing in many countries, especially from the centrist right or the liberal uh, uh, political parties, but also in some, uh, in some cases from, uh, from the social democrats, right? Um, 
But I would argue more the, the centrist right is the those are those who are really co-opting these policy claims, uh, though they are twisting a little bit um, the 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 way how they frame their arguments. Uh, I mean, less blatantly racist and more like you know we want to protect the Muslims. That why are we doing these and that's these and those measures and that's why we're implementing them. But um, coming back to the initial question, Macron and why Macron? Very similar to what I just talked about uh, for the Austrian case, when the murder of Samuel Paty, the French history teacher happened, Macron used this as an excuse to crack down massively on the Muslim civil society. They raided numerous mosques. Meanwhile, they also closed a lot of them. They closed also anti-racist organizations like the most, one of the most well-known ones, uh, CCIF, the Collective Against Islamophobia in France, alongside other humanitarian and other uh, organizations. Um, and that all of these measures went along other authoritarian uh, um, uh, movements, like, for instance, when uh, the Minister of Education said, as well as Macron himself, argued that um, one of the problems in France would be the import of dangerous knowledge from the United States, which is post-colonial studies, gender studies, racism studies, and critical race theory. So um, he basically criticized French scholars and intellectuals who would use these methods and theories in order to criticize the French government saying this is a dangerous knowledge that, according to him, divides the French society. And again, I think that is very, very much what, what I just read about the files when, they, when the, the, the Austrian state authorities speak about um, 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 Islamophobia, right? It's like yeah. you create the caliphate when you speak about Islamophobia. So it's, you know, these measures, you know, going against freedom of speech, going against freedom of knowledge production, going against freedom of association, going against freedom of religion. This is what authoritarianism is all about, right? And in that way, I think Macron really earned it because the way he implemented all of these measures, uh, I mean, that is outstanding. And I think the problem that we are also witnessing, I remember I was interviewed to what happened in France. And, you know, when I criticized it, a lot of journalists in Europe, they would say like, but, you know, there must be a reason why they're closing these mosques down. There, if there is a terrorism allegation going on, there is a reason. That, that was it, even before that happened to me. And I said, you know, no, no, because <laughs> uh, that, that is not the way you do it. And, 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 and the problem with just to, to and, and I'll end here. The problem is that the general uh, image Macron has is like he, he's a liberal guy. And, you know, calling his Islamophobia out, I think, is crucial for us to create a, a critical awareness in the European public space that we have to look very critically about what is going on here. And do you think that this is where the biggest risk lies, um, state-sanctioned Islamophobia? And, and do you see that uh, as a reality um, in the UK as well, uh, where recently, I mean, do you connect it to where recently, for example, the government passed uh, legislation where they can withdraw citizenship without notification of the notification. Um, do you see any connection in that? Uh, do you see you know, France and Austria being the template for what UK will do, what many of the other more liberal countries or countries that haven't taken the authoritarian turn as France and Austria has? Do you, do you think they see Austria, France as a template? This is what we want to be replicating in our countries? I think France and Austria and Denmark see, th see themselves as a template that should be copied by the other countries. And this is also what we have seen after these two um, um, uh, militant attacks in Vienna and Paris. What happened was there was this incident when uh, ministers of interior of the European Union uh, issued a statement. And this draft came from Germany, Austria, and France, and in included several mentions of Islam which at the final draft, because of all the other EU countries that pushed against it, the final draft only included one mention of Islam. 
But that shows us still also that, you know, the dynamics that are going on within the European, it's not that France and Austria rule the game, but they obviously very much interested. And that was, it's, is also what we saw in, at the end of October, there was this forum against radicalization that happened in, in Austria. And again, who was participating, Denmark, France, and uh, some politicians from uh, Flanders uh, in Belgium. So what we see is, yes, they have, this agenda that they want to become the leaders in this effort. At the very same time, I do hope that the UK stands outside of these dynamics. And, you know, also one of the things that is quite interesting to see, you know, our European Islamophobia report, we presented it several times within the European, uh, in the European Parliament. And it was always, except of the first time, on behalf of an invitation that came from UK politicians. MEPs, members of the European Parliament, that were not only from the Greens or the Socialists, the Labour Party, but also from, from uh, uh, um, uh, the Conservatives. Pardon me. So it was also from the Conservatives, which shows you, I think, that really um, the point of departure where you discuss these issues in, in the UK is very different to what you find in continental Europe. So I would argue, uh, while there are obviously lots of problems also going on in the UK, and you know that much more than I do uh, in detail, um, and I think those state legislations, you know, uh, taking the citizenship from people, very much tied to terrorism uh, laws, etc., that is very problematic, and that I would see that as a very problematic trend within, uh, you know, uh, this authoritarian development. But I would also argue that the UK is much better off than a lot of other continental European countries, not at least because Muslims just play a much better and more important role in the public sphere. Um, you do have MPs on, on certain levels uh, of uh, uh, municipalities, national level, etc. If you compare that with countries like Germany or, or, or France, it's not comparable. Yeah, yeah. No, I think um, you, you touched up on the fact that UK is in a much better place. And I think we're also seeing in the US, at least in, on, on the Democrat side, a recognition that Islamophobia is a concern and they've passed a law recently which has passed congress while well, not senate at the moment but at least um a house of representatives where they voted to um set up a office monitoring islamophobia around the world which which is which is a positive sign uh, I, 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 would you not say yes absolutely and i mean you know i think the united states in many ways is very different um, um so yes first of all i mean this legislation came uh, into Elia from Ilhan Omar, but not only from her as a Muslim, also from other Congress people who supported this legislation. And uh, no matter what happens <laughs> to, to that legislation, um, because that legislation would especially be part of the State Department's Office for Inter Religious Freedom. And if you look, for instance, into the reports on interreligious freedom by the US State Department on France, you will see that they talk about these issues critically. So that shows you again that, you know, they have their eyes on, on these developments and they see it not um, as something that is, that should be taken as an example. It is a problem for them of religious freedom. That's by definition being part of these uh, reports. Also the, 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 the rate that happened in Austria, by the way, was mentioned in the interreligious freedom report on Austria by the state, US State Department. So, uh, yes, I think these are good signs, though I, I think there is an international relations aspect, obviously, to this act, because uh, uh, the United States are preoccupied um, with what is going on in Xinjiang and using this also against China. So there is like it is part of parcel of a grand strategy of international politics to some extent. But nevertheless, you know, while in Europe, we are still thinking about should we recognize Islamophobia as a term, you know, you have these policies going on in the United States. It shows you how much apart these countries are from each other. At the very same time, you know, 
uh, we have the coordinator on anti-Muslim hate uh, crime in Europe in, by the European Union. And this position has not been filled since half a year and has been va vacant. So that also shows you the few emphasis uh, the, Euro the current European Commission puts on these issues. Um, and again, uh, that's only one example of several ones uh, that show you uh, um, that these issues are not taken seriously. At the very same time, let's say, for instance, the F Fundamental Rights Agency of, or the European Union has just issued a report where they especially problematized that all the anti-terrorism legislation is especially a threat uh, to the Muslim community within Europe. This is something that you see that certain bodies do problematize uh, these uh, policies that are in place while you know that, that there are also other forces coming especially from countries like France who try to suppress all of this critical knowledge that is produced and try to just continue their policies. I mean, even what happened with the raid, the Austrian political elite is still like, yeah, that was a good thing, and we're not going to go one step back here. Uh, although the court has ruled that this raid was unlawful, and also uh, in the meantime, a lot of people have spoken out against it. Mm. One final question. I mean, we've covered a lot of uh, ground here, um, and we, we ended up in the US, and I was wondering whether I could um, stay there and ask you about a, um, a report that was published by CARE, uh, the, the American Council on American Islamic Relations. Um, they also published a report on Islamophobia within the US and the funding that goes into the Islamophobia network. And they found that 106 million was poured into some 26 different organizations pushing, peddling Islamophobia in media and various uh, parts of society. Just a final question. I mean, do, do you see something similar in, in the European context uh, where there are millions and millions of pounds being through charitable organizations, through donations, which is being pumped into a network of hate uh, against Muslim across Europe? Um, well, yes, absolutely. I mean, there is a concerted effort um, on behalf of uh, different international players who are very much interested in disenfranchising Muslim rights and uh, uh, stabilizing their own position of power in their own countries, <clears throat> who are very much, um, you know, um, I mean, it's interesting, you know, because I remember one of my first pieces that I wrote back in 2017 on those think tanks, I, I spoke about the European Foundation for Democracy, that is a Brussels-based think tank, very much connected also to uh, financialists coming from uh, the United States. And their, their major, one of their major projects was basically criminalizing Muslim civil society by creating a link between uh, native Muslim organizations and the Muslim Brotherhood. And this Muslim Brotherhood allegation is kind of like, you know, because nobody really want, knows what the Muslim Brotherhood is all about, and it sounds kind of uh, uh, dangerous, and that's why we we make these kinds of uh, create these affiliations. And that has been uh, one strong attempt by these uh, scholars who were affiliated with that think tank. We see that also in a lot of think tanks with uh, that are based in in the east of the uh, of, of Europe, especially in the Balkans where people try to uh, diminish the role Muslims have played and are playing within those countries. So obviously there are a lot of different groups who are interested out of different reasons to mingle into this issue and to have a say and to support these anti-Muslim sentiments. And especially, I would argue, to create knowledge in order to criminalize those Muslims who are active on the scene. Um, and that's not necessarily always like, you know, Muslims who care about their religion. It's also very much about the politics, some um, even cultural Muslims, so to say, um, um, pursue uh, by having an agency and speaking on behalf either of disenfranchised Muslim community within their domestic sphere, or also speaking on international issues like the Palestine issue. Um, so there is a wide range, I think, of actors who become a, 
a threat to those interests who are pouring that kind of money uh, into uh, these programs and think tanks and so on and so forth. Um, no, it's, it's fantastic, Farid. I mean, uh, we've spoken much longer than we normally do. Normally, it's our program's half an hour, but it shows how much ground we've covered and how interesting your conver our conversation has been. Uh, I want to thank you for, for, for joining us today. Uh, I highly recommend the report. I mean, as I said, it is quite long, uh, but choose the country you want to read. Uh, I will we'll share the link on Memo website. Uh, I recommend our readers to, you know, download it and have a look uh, and choose the country you want. You may not want to read 900 pages worth, of course, but uh, I found it very, very interesting, at least executive summary and the countries of my choice, which was in this case, Austria and France and the UK. Um, but in any case, um, I want to thank Farid and thank our viewers at home and uh, we'll um, join you again soon. Thank you very much and bye bye.